Welcome. Today is Thursday, November 18, class session at Math 261. This is multivariable calculus at Delta College. And we have some important topics for you today. I've written down some vocabulary words we're going to work on, but our major topic for the day is to characterize conservative fields and to show you the value in recognizing a conservative field. Uh, just before we get started, remember that next week you have a well-earned break. So we only have one class session. There's no classes at Delta College. Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. So our only class session is on Tuesday. No office hours. My Wednesday office hours won't be available. No Thursday class or office hours, etc. So this is the 24th. 25th and 26th. So I want you to enjoy your Thanksgiving break. And do a little math, but do more relaxing than math. Uh, you can still send me email or ask a question. I don't mind at all. I just may not respond as quickly as I normally do on those days. So just focus on that. After we come back, we'll make our final push for the end of the course, which you've already begun here in chapter six. I just wanna share the schedule with you to show you exactly how close to the end we are. So next week we'll discuss a kind of a fun and useful theorem. It's called Green's theorem, which is one of the consequences of our interest in conservative fields. Green's theorem is something of a question like, conservative fields are awesome. Conservative fields allow you to do a beautiful, beautiful shortcut in your calculations. But what happens if you don't have a conservative field? Are things completely hopeless? Are you allowed no shortcuts in your calculations? So conservative vector fields are the ultimate, but the remaining three major theorems of the course, these are the highlight of the course, Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, and Gauss's theorem, which people call the divergence theorem, but more people call Gauss's theorem. These three major theorems of vector calculus are telling you what happens what kind of shortcuts can you take if you don't always have the beautiful conservative field? So just a half week next week, two more weeks, two sections each, lightened up near the end of the semester so we can focus on the material a little more. And then in our very last week of the course, we'll repeat our review and exam cycle with the change that uh, exam three I'm anticipating is going to be uh, Saturday to Saturday, not Tuesday to Tuesday, because I have to collect and submit grades very quickly when the semester is over. Okay, that's the plan. So we were looking at section 6162 and 63 last time. Vector fields, section 61, line integrals section 6.2, and now today, section 6.3, conservative fields. So they're interrelated topics, but first I have to bring you some vocabulary that you have very nice images for in the book. But I wanna make sure we go over these words together just so that you hear them pronounced and used. And these are gonna be used, these kind of words are gonna be used to 
give a complete description of conservative fields. When characteristic, when someone uses characterization as a word in mathematics, they mean a complete description. I mean, it's very easy to say, well, if this happens, then this happens. That's called a conditional. If A happens, then B happens. If it's Tuesday, I will give everyone $10, which is perfectly okay as long as on the next Tuesday, I give everyone $10. But if tomorrow I gave everyone $10, it doesn't mean that it's Tuesday. In fact, tomorrow is Friday. So when someone says, if then, it means if you meet the condition, then you get this result. But just because you see the result doesn't mean the condition could be met. I could give you $10 on a day that's not Tuesday. But if you can go in both directions, it is Tuesday if and only if I give everyone $10. If that's how I characterize Tuesdays, then every Tuesday that comes along, you expect me to give you $10. And on any day that I give you $10, you feel certain that it's a Tuesday. That would be a characterization of Tuesdays. It would be a complete description of Tuesdays. That description is enough to recognize Tuesdays under any other conditions. That's what characterization means. So we are interested in characterizing conservative fields. We can tell you several consequences of conservative fields, but just because we see something happening doesn't mean the field is conservative. We want to have absolute certainty when you're dealing with a conservative field. So these are some of the words that we're gonna to use to get that absolute certainty. So let's talk about and right now, I'm talking about, for the first moment, curves in the plane. I'm talking in two dimensions right now, although we can extend this to three dimensions later. Let's talk about curves and regions. And I will qualify this by saying in the plane, in two dimensions. So a curve is called simple if it doesn't cross itself. I'm not gonna write that down, it's written down in the book. This curve is a simple curve because it never crosses itself. This curve is not a simple curve because it crosses itself. So that's a very simple definition. You know. Har, 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 no pun intended. A closed curve is a curve that ends where it begins. So here's a curve that starts off here, does some dances, comes back to where it began. It's called a closed curve. I could cross the curve and come back to where I started. That's also caused a closed curve. A curve can be closed, but not simple, as the one here on the right. It could be simple, but not closed, as I have the curve in the upper left. But a curve that is both simple and closed has a very special property. So here is a curve that is both simple and closed. And to state the special property in a very simple way, a simple closed curve has a clear inside and outside. I have a region that's defined by that simple closed curve. I have a clear understanding of inside and outside. Or I've separated the plane into two regions. You know, what you call inside and outside might be arbitrary to you, but I've separated the plane clearly into two regions. Up here, 
this curve is close, but not simple. So I'm not sure what it is that I should shade the inside or the outside region. I did not separate the plane into two regions. Maybe you have a feeling I separated the plane into three regions, but I don't wanna argue about how many regions I have here because I haven't fully described the path. So this is the first thing to put in your brain. A curve can be simple, a curve could be closed, a curve could be one and not the either. But if a curve is simple and closed, it's a very nice curve because it separates the plane into two clear regions. Let's talk about regions. Regions can be connected or not connected. This region here on the left in blue is a connected region. And connected can be as simple as saying, I can get from any point inside that region to any other point inside that region by following a path that remains totally in that region. This region is not connected because I cannot get from this point to this point and remain in the region. Connected seems like a pretty simple idea, but actually connected is a very fancy idea in mathematics and in later mathematics. There's all kinds of variations on connected, path connected, but the one we're interested in is called simply connected. So here's a region in the plane that's connected and I'm gonna use the shaded region right here, but not simply connected. Simply connected in one phrase means doesn't connected, but doesn't have a hole in it. For example, this pool with a little island over here, I'm drawing very small, I understand that. This region that I'll shade very darkly, except for this island in the middle. Let's call this a swimming pool. When I do this, I'm making a big blue blob on the next sheet of paper. So I'm not always interested in doing this. But this is a beautiful swimming pool with a little island in the middle that sticks out of the water. You can get from any point in the swimming pool to any other point in the swimming pool by remaining in the swimming pool. This swimming pool is connected. But people say it's not simply connected because of this island here. Simply connected means if you put a simple closed curve in the region, you can shrink it to a dot without leaving the region. You can't put a simple closed curve along any point that is not in the region. That's another way to say it. So if you pretend you put a rope inside this pool around this island, and you want to shrink that rope to a single point, some type of lasso, when you're going around this island, you can't close that loop. You can't close that lasso without the rope leaving the pool. The rope is gonna be cinched up around this island. So simply connected basically means a region where any closed, simple closed loop can be shrunk to a point without leaving the region. That's a kind of like a very fancy version of connected. But simply connected regions turn out to be very valuable regions. I'll read to read that shrink a loop to a point definition inside the book. So with these descriptions of the plane, of curves in the plane and regions in the plane, now we have the language we need that we could characterize conservative fields. 
We're also going to give an example of what people call the fundamental theorem for line integrals. It was an awesome, awesome shortcut. And we're going to talk about path independence. Okay, so that is the goal for today. Before we do that, I want to brief review of the line integrals we did last time. And the reason why is because we're going to use line integrals to characterize conservative fields. So we have to be very, very certain what a line integral is and the two special forms of line integrals that we gave last time, the flow and the flux integrals. So remember a line integral, is the contribution of function to a path. And it's written as the integral of f over c with respect to distance. This is how we write this, this is how we speak it. But this has things coded inside it. Coded inside this is a path. And you don't have a path unless you tell me the formula of the path, you know, the instructions for following the path, and a starting and ending point on the path. So you don't have a path unless you describe those things to me. Uh, what I'm saying for line integrals, it could also be written for a three-dimensional path or a function of three variables, but we'll stick with a plane for right now because that's where we'll spend most of our time today. A function right here is a real valued function of a vector variable. Here are two dimensions. X and Y is the vector we input, some point or vector in the plane and the output is a real number. The ds, how many colors do I have left, is from the derivative of distance with respect to time, which you recognize as speed. Speed is the magnitude of velocity and velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. Remember when we made that distinction, R position, S distance. The derivative of S with respect to T is called speed. It's magnitude of velocity. The derivative of R with respect to T is called velocity, rate of change of position with respect to time. So when you put these three things together, path, function, distance, and you get the expression for evaluating a line integral, which says you evaluate the function on the points of the path. And the little bit of distance is measured as a speed times the little bit of time. So this is the description, and this is the evaluation. And then last time, excited by our new discovery of contributing a path, a function to a path, we said, well, what kind of functions should we contribute to paths? And in the case of a vector field, we wondered what part of the vector field flowed with me along that path C? What part of the vector field is contributing to C as I move along the path from A to B? What part of the vector field is in some sense ignoring 
the path. Neither helping me nor hindering me. Wind is not at my back or the wind is not in my face if I was sailing a boat. And I could measure these contributions to a curve. And these were called flow and flux. And I'll draw a picture of the physical image in a second, but I'm just reviewing the vocabulary here. If C is a simple closed curve, oriented counterclockwise, And I see I'm going to have to go to a different sheet of paper here in a second. But first of all, I said, what does it mean to orient a curve counterclockwise? Let's go back up here to my drawing of simple closed curve. I said it separated the plane into two regions, like inside and outside. But I also have two methods of driving along this boundary. I can drive counterclockwise, that is keeping the interior on my left-hand side and the exterior on my right-hand side. Or I could drive clockwise, keeps the interior on the right side. And it keeps the exterior on the left side. Now, whether I drive clockwise or counterclockwise around the region, that's just gonna be a matter of sign when I perform many integrals. But you always have to take a base or reference point. So our base is that our default is that when we drive on the boundary of a simple closed curve, we will always speak as if we were driving counterclockwise. That's how our calculations are set up to be written. And in that case, you get to use another symbol which is an integral with a line through it. And that works for any line integral, integral with a circle on it. That works for any line integral or these flow and flux line integrals. In the old days, people would also put an arrow on that closed loop to remind you that you were driving counterclockwise. And I make a point of this because, as I said last time, in the book, they're using this symbol much too casually for curves that are not simple closed curves. Okay, so be careful not to just draw this casually because it looks good and it looks mysterious and it makes you look smarter, right? This symbol is reserved for simple closed curves that I drive in the counterclockwise direction. Let's make a larger picture so we can make sure that we are all agreement on what we're doing here. Let's say I'm in the plane. I'm gonna stay in the plane right now. Several of the things that I'm saying or I'm about to say would still work in space, but it's not time to discuss them yet. So let's take a curve, goes through the dots, created by the bleeding pen. This is my curve C. I start and stop at the same place. Notice when I start and stop at the same place, let's call this point right here, the point where T equals A or where T equals B. But when I start and, when I start and stop, where did 
I draw this before? When I start and stop, and I don't start and stop at the same place, remember we always had this beautiful orientation. I start here, I stop there, I'm going this direction. But when I start and stop at the same place, then I lose that orientation kind of. Did I drive this way around the curve or did I drive that way around the curve? So we're saying to you that our default will be to drive counterclockwise. So that the region R, I'll try to lightly shade it this time so I don't bleed through to the next sheet, stays on our left and the exterior stays on our right. I'm gonna do a super zoom of this space right here to remind you what we said about normal vectors last time. So as I fly through here on my curve, remember I have the natural unit tangent vector that we defined earlier in the course. But the N I'm talking about is not the same as this unit tangent vector, uh, as same as the unit normal vector we did before. Before, when I draw a curve like this, I put my normal vector in the point of bending. But as I drive along this pool, sorry, I don't have my paper oriented nicely. As I drive along this pool, sometimes I bend to the left, sometimes I bend to the right, bend to the left, bend to the right, bend to the left, bend to the right. But I don't want my normal to be hopping back and forth across the line I'm drawing. That's going to be hard for me to count, to add up contribution of the integral. So in the case of a simple closed curve here, I always want the unit normal to be pointing outwards. So in this case, the unit tangent vector, remember, is V over mag V. And the unit tangent vector ds that we use in our flow integral is then V over mag V. DS is mag V times DT. Now, when I want to get down into the nitty gritty of this component wise, <coughs> what does that mean? Well, the mag V's cancel out, and I'm left with dr DT times DT. dr DT is DX DT, dy DT. Times dt. If you treat this as a quantity, this little piece of time, this infinitesimal time, then you have a vector which is made of an infinitesimal x change and an infinitesimal y change. So that's the tiny direction that t is pointing in. In order to keep our n always on our right hand side, the unit normal always on the right as I drive around this loop, then I'm going to express this as a certain relation to T. Notice here in this drawing T is over on the x-axis and the up on the y-axis, up in the vertical direction, over in the horizontal, up, right vertical, or right on the horizontal, up on the vertical. Well, I want to change that vertical distance I cover to be the horizontal distance of n, and I want to change that horizontal distance I cover for t to be the vertical distance of n opposite. <coughs> Excuse me. So I write that as dy and minus dx. 
So that again is a convention that says, I will always keep that motion. I will always keep that unit vector on my right-hand side. So NDS, just like TDS turns out to be infinitesimal dx dy, NDS turns out to be the infinitesimal dy minus dx. Okay, that's how I take these things from their description to their actual evaluation. And I want to point out to you what that means. I can write these integrals in multiple forms. Here, f dot t ds, if I think of t ds as simply dr, I can write this integral as f dot dr, <coughs> which we commonly call work force dotted with distance. Force times distance is work. I can also, if I think of this function as f and g, and the t ds as dx dy, sometimes you see line integrals written like this. Integral over c, f dx plus g dy. That I didn't use this notation last time, which is part of why I'm reviewing here now. This looks really odd because I'm integrating over a curve, which is neither in the x direction nor in the y direction entirely, but I'm being told to integrate with respect to x and integrate with respect to y. And the answer is no, you're supposed to be substituting into all four of these pieces, just like you substituted here or here. But this is a different way of expressing the dot product of f and t, of f and t ds. And likewise, if you have f as component functions, little f and little g here, but n ds is dy and minus dx, then you can write the f dot n ds as integral of f dy minus g dx. Now that looks a little bit like double talk because isn't this integral just the same as this integral? Aren't these two integrals then the same, but I switch the position and the sign of the component functions? But what I can say is the flow integral here could be equal to a flux integral for a differently defined field, the field minus g comma f, or I could say a flux integral could be a different kind of flow integral. So notice that these are not the same and it's not just a matter of switching things around. I could recognize these in either way, but sometimes in the old style of writing, people used to write like this, f dx plus g dy, even plus h dz if I'm talking about three dimensions. Here, uh, flux integral f dy minus g dx. I will say this one word now about three dimensions because this hints at what's going to happen to us soon. In three dimensions, let's say the field is shorthand characterized by f, g, and h. And let's say the TDS is dx, dy, dz. That's the same natural result of having one extra slot in the velocity and position. Then there's a natural way to understand the flow integral. F dot T ds. I can still read this as F dot dr, as F dot T ds, as a line integral in this old notation. 
with just one more component called HDZ. So there's a natural way to extend flow into space. Flow along a thread on the table could be flow extended in a natural way along a wire twisted in space. But as how to mix up these, like could I imitate flux in space over a curve? Well, the answer is that's ridiculous. How do you talk about the flux of a field across a wire bent into space? It's easy to talk about the flow along the wire, but what does it mean to cross a wire in space? In the case of two dimensions, it's very easy what it means to cross a wire. There's a left side, there's a right side. Simple closed curve, there's an inside, there's an outside. But flux in space cannot be extended to a curve in any natural way. Now we need to think about flux in space as what? Water spilling through a grate at the end of a pipe, air being pumped through the HVAC ducts, blowing in and out of a window. So when we talk about a field crossing a boundary in space, we're talking about something crossing a surface, the grate at the end of a pipe, the screen in your window. So flux, to be extended to space, will require some more machinery, will require a further discussion. Okay, good. So this is just prepping you for what we're about to do. Not next week. Next week, we're gonna stay in the plane with Green's theorem for our one session. But after that, our job is to further explore the connection between these things to extend flux to space and then understand how I can use it. Okay, so now you've got a fair feeling for, or a fair reminder of what line integrals are and the two most famous ways that apply line integrals in the plane. And now we're interested in conservative fields. So it's the general discussion, then we'll start to use, get my pages in order here, calculations after the break. Remember we referred to conservative fields last time as gradient fields. Fields created by the gradient of a function. So let's be, I'm not talking about two dimensional or three dimensional alone. Let's take a function like x sine x, y. There's a function of two variables. Let's take a function of three variables, g, just for example, and we'll say x squared y plus y squared z plus, uh, let's get some symmetry going on in here, z squared x. 
These are real valued functions of a vector variable. So I can take the gradient of both of these, the gradient of f, partial f, partial x, comma partial f, partial y is, now this is the harder one because I could do a little product rule right here. This is just a bunch of power rules right here. But I have a product rule, differentiate with respect to x, first times the derivative of the second, derivative of the second is cosine of x, y, I differentiate this with respect to x, give me a y come out. So first derivative would be x, y, cosine x, y. And the derivative with respect to y. Uh, oh, sorry, I got to finish my product rule, don't I? I did first times derivative of the second. Now I got to do second times the derivative of the first, which is one, is plus sine x, y. Now I can differentiate this with respect to y, which is a little bit easier. Sine becomes cosine, differentiate the inside with respect to y and x comes out. That's x squared cosine y, x, y. This is a field with two slots. Now I've used f, g, and h for the components of the field. But sometimes I use f and g and h as these functions that I take the gradients of. So it's not a wrong policy and it's not unique to this author. Many times in a two dimensional field, people call the first component function q, uh, p, and the second component function q. So be aware if the author is using p and q, then this is the way that they use it. Uh, whether I use f and g or p and q is no matter here, but if I'm using f and g to represent these functions that I'm taking the gradient of, it would be awkward. It would be wrong to say gradient of f and then here say f and g. It's not the same f and g. Okay, let's take the gradient of g. Partial g, partial x, partial g, partial y partial g, partial z. And this is polynomials, a little bit more friendly. Partial g, partial x, give me a 2xy, where's another x over here, plus z squared. And then second slot, partial g, partial y, give me an x squared and a 2yz. There's no y in this third position. Partial g, partial z, nothing. Y squared, two xc. We've got a kind of nice symmetry going on along here. And this is also a field often to avoid the confusion like I just cited. When people refer to a three-dimensional field like this, they say P, Q, and R. So I'm kind of going to be neutral whether I should use P, Q, and R, whether I should use F, G, and H, or F and G. But if I give the potential function name like F and G, then I can't use F and G over here. I said this word without introducing it potential functions. These functions that I take the gradients of are called the potential functions of what? Of these fields that I've created. The field f of x and y and the field g of x and y and z. This was a three-dimensional field. Sometimes people use this convention that if the field is capital F vector, then the potential function is lowercase f. If the field is capital G vector, then the potential function is lowercase g or vice versa. And now I want you to notice something really odd about these gradient fields. And this is what our discussion needs to be before we take a break, before we get into actual calculations. 
let's look up here at P and Q in this F of X, Y field in two dimensions. Look at the partial derivative of P now, but with respect to Y. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, now I've got two Y's and two pieces. I'm gonna have to do some product rule again here in the first. So a little bit messy, but be patient with it. So let's look at the partial derivative of P with respect to Y right here. So first is X, Y times the derivative of the second with respect to Y would be a minus X come out minus X sine X, Y. And then minus X would strike this. So I get a minus X squared Y sine x, y. Now second times derivative of the first, derivative of the first with respect to y is x. So I pick up an x cos x, y. But I'm not done because I take the derivative of this with respect to y, which is only a single function, thankfully. x come out, sine turns into cosine, plus x cosine x, y. Notice that that's same piece here twice it appears. So I get minus x squared y sine x y plus 2x cos x y. Look at partial q now, partial x. Now remember partial p partial y, what was the p? The p was partial f partial x. So what I'm doing right here when I take partial P partial Y is taking partial F partial X and taking the derivative of that with respect to Y. This is the second order mixed partial. And likewise, partial Q partial X. Well, Q was partial F partial Y. And I'm taking the second order mixed partial with respect to X. So these are the two second order mixed partials under the proper conditions, these matched. And you see when you take the derivative of Q with respect to X, we're gonna execute a product rule. First times derivative of the second. So a minus Y comes out, there's a Y come out, cosine turns into minus sine. So you get a minus X squared Y, sine X Y. And then second times the derivative of the first with respect to X, give me a two X cos X Y. So it turns out that partial P partial Y minus partial Q or equals partial Q partial X. These two things are the same in a conservative field, in a field created by a gradient. Now you could write that in two ways. This is either partial Q partial X minus partial P partial Y is zero, or you could write this as partial P partial Y minus partial Q partial X is zero. And it might not seem to make any difference to you, but the orientation we're gonna use is partial P partial Y minus partial Q partial X is equal to zero. So this is the case in a two-dimensional gradient field. What about three dimensions? In three dimensions, it's not quite so obvious. I mean, I'm not comparing left and right. I'm not comparing slot one and slot two. I don't have variable one and variable two. I actually have three slots and three variables. So what happens in a gradient field among these slots. It's a little more complicated, but what ends up happening, and we'll show you a device for this in a second. I, I gotta be careful about which one I choose right here. And I'm gonna think about this carefully. I actually think this is gonna be the order we prefer in the end. But right now, just say that they're equal, no order preferred. 
Now, likewise, it's going to be the case for this P, Q, and R up here in the three-dimensional case. And we'll take a break. It's partial R partial Y is going to be the same as partial Q partial Z. Partial R partial X is going to be the same as partial P partial Z. And partial Q partial X is going to be the same as partial P partial Y. Now that's a weird mixing of these three things, three functions, three variables, but let's check. And the P, Q, and R are not so burdensome right here, so it's not hard to check. Partial R partial Y in this case is just 2Y. But partial Q partial Z also happens to be 2Y. Partial R partial X is 2Z only. Once you check partial P partial Z, you also get 2z. It's kind of interesting. And partial q partial x is 2x. Now you can predict partial p partial y is also 2x. So this is what happens in a gradient field in three dimensions. These three partial equations, these three mixed partials match. Now there's gonna be an easier way for me to, to state both of these, but right now let's just focus on these partial equations. So here's the question, and we gotta take this up when we come back from the break. And remember, we gave you the illustration of if it's Tuesday, I'm gonna give you $10. So, Sorry, no $10 for you today. Well, unless I'm feeling particularly generous and I'll give you $10 anyway. Of course, I don't even have $10 in my pocket. But here's a question. If conservative fields exhibit this property of certain mixed partials being equal, if conservative fields always exhibit this property, if gradient fields always exhibit this property, can I turn it around? What happens if I meet a field someday that has this property? Can I assume it's conservative? What happens if I give you $10 on the day next week? Can you assume that it's Tuesday? And that's not an easy question. So what happens if I satisfy these properties, these mixed partial properties, can I assume I have a conservative field? Because I might be handed a field without a potential function. It's wonderful if I'm handed a field and I'm told how it was created, but what happens if I'm handed a field and I don't know how it's created? What advantage will that be to me? I'd like to go searching for its potential function. And that's going to be the heart of what conservative means. But how do I know it's even got a potential function? How do I know the field is conservative? So when I say let's characterize conservative fields, I mean, here is one property of conservative fields. Is it good enough to fully describe conservative fields? And the answer, I won't keep you in suspense, is yes, under a certain condition. Under certain conditions, this will be enough to recognize conservative fields. And those are the conditions we have to talk about when we come back. Talk about and illustrate the use of. So this is a convenient place to take a break. Let's see, 58, 5, 4, 6. Let's come back at 904. And then 
we'll explore this curious property further. I'm gonna mute my microphone and stretch my legs for a second and you're welcome to do the same.
Okay, now we're back. Uh, I want to point out something else on the website, and because I haven't drawn many pictures of fields, fields are not easy things for me to draw pictures of by hand, because you're always saying, well, where should I put the arrows? Which arrows should I put? Should I make the arrows scaled truly according to their definition, or should I try to make the ales, uh, arrows scaled proportionally? Well, if I'm going to scale them proportionally, don't I need to know the lengths of all the arrows? So drawing fields, it's easy to talk about fields, but drawing them is not trivial. And so we gave some examples of drawing fields last time, but I want to make sure when you're doing your homework problems that you're thinking about how you could illustrate what you're calculating in Mathematica. So remember, I gave you a special notebook last time. Let's go back to my website to make sure we're all on the same page. Here under week 12, here under week 12 technology, I placed this notebook that will help you do the exercise that you're submitting this evening. So I don't have the work done in that notebook, but I have that notebook set up with another example that we gave last time that you could modify to match your exercise 6280. So I just reminded you that's the one of the things that you're submitting tonight, 6280. So use Mathematica to show fields and curves and how the fields and curves interact, even the graphing of the field specifically on a curve. You can do that in two or three dimensions. Okay, so now let's go back here. So we've discovered a curious property of gradient fields, a curious property of conservative fields. These mixed partials are matching. Now, before I go on, and I was arguing with myself about the order in which I want to write these, I can also write these as partial r partial y minus partial q partial z equals zero, or partial q partial z minus partial r partial y equals zero. I could write each of these in two directions. So is there a preferred direction? And is there a way to even remember which letter goes with which capital letter? Uh, r and y go with q and z, or is it p and z that go with r and y? No, p and z go with r and x. Is there a way to remember this jumbled mess in general? And the answer is yes, if we look at the language of the cross product. So here's a handy way. This will be page four. To remember these combinations of partial derivatives. And that is to think, let's look at the three-dimensional case and let's look of the pieces in the field in the three-dimensional case, I don't want to write out all the variables. I'll write it out one time and probably not again. See, if I say here's a three-dimensional field that depends on x, y, and z, and I have to talk about the function in the first slot that depends on x, y, and z, and the function in the second slot that depends on x, y, and z, and the function in the third slot that depends on x, y, and z. That's a lot of variable writing. So it's more common for people just to say f of x, y, and z is equal to p, q, and r. Or even f is equal to p, q, and r. Now I have some sympathy with you when you say, oh, but then I don't know who the independent variables are, or I forgot that these were functions over here of x, y, and z, or are they functions of x and y only? Well, that's what people call context. You have to know the context of what you're reading. So 
Let me look at the shortened version because it allows me to write the least here. But I want you to understand that f is a function of x, y, and z. I'm talking about the three-dimensional case, and so are p, q, and r component functions. So how I want to teach you a good way to remember these relationships and to know a preferred order. Let's take a cross product. So we've done cross product before as the determinant of a three-dimensional vector. Let's put the P, Q, and R in the last row, the I, J, and K in the first row. This is one of the ways we thought about doing cross products. But in the second row, let's place partial, partial X, partial, partial Y, and partial, partial Z which are not numbers or vectors, they're instructions to take the derivative with respect to x, with respect to y, with respect to z. Now, ordinarily in the determinant, when we first defined determinant, or when you first defined determinant, whatever class you did, you thought of the entries in a matrix as being numbers. Well, we quickly violated that when we talked about the cross product, because here, the entries in the top row are vectors themselves. Here in the bottom row, we had, when we did the cross product, these were numbers and these were numbers. But now in the bottom row, I'm saying that these are not numbers, these are functions of X, Y, and Z. So here's some vectors, here's some functions, and now even worse, in the second row, they're not numbers, they're not functions, they're instructions to take the derivative with respect to this variable or that variable or another variable. Well, let's not think about right now whether this is a legal matrix or determinant. Let's just practice doing the cross product. And that is to block out the first row and first column and say I times this determinant. And if you think of this determinant as doing the derivatives, it's partial Y, partial, partial R, partial Y minus partial Q, partial Z partial r, partial y, minus partial q, partial z. And that's times i. Now in the second slot, when I block out the first row and the second column, I have partial r, partial x, minus partial p, partial z. Remember in the j column, I take the opposite of what I see. So this is really partial P partial Z minus partial R partial X. But I'm gonna put the minus sign out here and write it as I see it. Partial R partial X minus partial P partial Z. That's the J slot. And then the K slot of course block out the K row and K column, I have partial Q partial X minus partial P partial Y. Now I take this as a way of remembering both this set of three partial equations and this single partial equation. If you look at this properly. So this is the IJK notation here. Sometimes I prefer the bracket notation, partial R, partial Y, minus partial Q, partial Z. I also prefer to leave myself more space, which I didn't do here. Now notice the minus sign right here. So I write this as partial P, partial Z, minus partial R, partial X. And then third slot, partial Q, partial X minus partial P, partial Y. So if you want to know which functions P, Q, and R go with which variables in which order, what you can do is think of these mixed partials as a cross product. And this game has a name and a symbol that we're gonna use later, it's called the curl 
of the field F. Before I talk about that word some more, let's just think about what if F was a function of only P and Q? What if it was only two dimensions? What if there was no R? Well, that's a little bit like saying, I have a field of X and Y with no Z slot. No Z input, no third dimension of output. And you see what would happen if I put that into this machine. Excuse me, I have to move my paper up. I, J, and K, P, Q, and zero. Well, on the I slot, I'd be taking the derivative of zero with respect to Y, which is zero, but I'd be taking the derivative of Q with respect to Z, but Q doesn't depend on Z. This would be a naturally zero. In the middle slot, I'll take the derivative of zero with respect to X, which is zero, and the derivative of P with respect to Z, but P doesn't depend on Z. So this would actually be zero minus zero in either order, this is zero. In the third slot, I actually get a hit, Excuse me, I didn't mean to hit you. Partial Q partial X minus partial P partial Y. So notice that this third equation matches what we wrote up here and what I called after checking myself the preferred direction. There's no difference between these two equations, but most often we write as partial Q partial X minus partial P partial Y. And we also call that the curl of the field F. Now, whether you write curl as this symbol, which is the upside down triangle cross F, I'm trying to remind you that you're kind of thinking about this as a cross product. And this symbol nabla, that's a Hebrew letter nabla, you say often stands for partial partial x, partial partial y, partial partial z. It's called an operator. It's something that's, it's like a function of functions. When I use the gradient right here, it was like I applied partial partial x, partial partial y to f or partial, partial X, partial, partial Y, partial, partial Z, I re applied that to G. So I thought of this upside down triangle. Some people call it del F, del G, or nabla F, nabla G. Uh, the letter is referred to as nabla. But sometimes people just pronounce this as del, as in a replacement for derivative. But whether I write this as del cross F or whether I write this as a curl F, this idea of curl is something that we need to investigate in the future. We will investigate that starting Tuesday of next week. But right now, I just wanted to give you a simple way to remember which variables are matched which mixed, which partial derivatives are matched against which partial derivatives in this case. Okay, good. So think of this as, that's one curious, excuse me, I gotta tear off my paper so I can move it up more easily. So this is one curious property of conservative functions. And when I say that, I mean
this equality of mixed partials. Of course, in the proper order, in the proper derivatives. But for a shorthand, I'll just call it the equality of mixed partials. Or some people say zero curl, that the curl is zero. If each one of these is zero, then I get the zero vector, zero curl. If this property, if this is equal to each other, and I get zero in this slide, I get a zero curl. But I won't speak that way until we formally tell you what curl is. How would you like to see another curious property of conservative fields? So let's say F, and I won't be prejudiced here, this could be two-dimensional or three-dimensional field. Is a gradient field. It is a conservative field. So that assumes something important. That assumes I meet the equality of mixed partials test because if I take it to be conservative, I must meet the equality of mixed partials test. And it means I know, excuse me while I number this page, I know the potential function for F. I know the function that created F, whether that's in two dimensions or three dimensions. Here I'll use F of X and Y, little f, to be the potential function for the two-dimensional case. And I'll use G of X, Y, and Z, although I didn't plan myself enough space to be the three-dimensional parent of this field F. Then if C is any, piecewise smooth curve in the plane or in space. Sorry, I'm sliding off the side of the paper now too. Let's tear this off so I can prepare. And I want you to evaluate F a TDS over this curve. Now remember, this could be a serious pain, especially if C is in many pieces. By piecewise smooth, remember all of our curves, we had to avoid the velocity ever equaling zero that equated to a kink or a sharp bend in the curve or a stopping of the object that was following that curve. A zero velocity, a zero speed. But I can think of a curve also as in several pieces. Even if I stop at that corner, I can think of that curve as in three nice pieces that don't have any stoppings along the way. In other words, I could organize my stoppings between the pieces of these curves.
with this beautiful property of conservative fields. I always have a starting place and a stopping place. If I know the function that gave birth to that field, and all I have to do is evaluate that potential function at the endpoint that I stop at and evaluate that potential function at the endpoint I began at. And that tells me the flow integral of that field over that curve. Now, what's really crazy about this is when I say evaluate the potential function at the ending place minus at the beginning place, well, there's billions of ways to get from the ending place to the beginning place. In fact, more than billions would be uncountably many in the plane or in space. Now, here I used the description in the plane, but I could have likewise written the same integral for space. You know, here, this f dot t ds <coughs> is considered to be f dot dr. Of course, that's plane or space. But here in the plane, it would be f dx plus g dy. If I was speaking in space, then I could still write this integral as work, f dot dr. But I'd have to acknowledge the third component, f dx plus g dy plus h dz. Here I get into trouble with my f's and g's and h's, right? Now I used f and g to represent the potential function. So I'm going to have to use p and q to represent the component functions of the field. P, Q, and R, D, Z. Okay, that's why you gotta be careful when you're naming things. So in this case, in three dimensions, if G gave birth to the field F, then I have to write G evaluated at the two endpoints. Now, before you say, wow, that's crazy. Anytime I have to do a flow integral, I just have to check out the value of the function at the endpoints. Well, the value of what function at the endpoints? The value of the potential function. If someone hands you a field, they may not hand you the potential function. In fact, the field may not have a potential function. When does a field not have a potential function? when the field is not conservative. Well, now you're hungry, hungry, hungry to know when a field is conservative. Because if a field's not conservative, if it doesn't have a potential function, then I lose access to this killer, killer shortcut. So now I really want to know how to identify conservative fields. Again, this is just a property of conservative fields. If a field is conservative, and someone doesn't give me this potential function, Can I recover it? Is there an easy way to create it? This is a really important question, so I write it out fully in English. The answer is yes, which I'll demonstrate for you now. But using words like simple 
Now I'm I'm all for using words like simple closed curve or simple curve because then there is a clear definition of the word simple. But in English, the word simple is badly, badly abused, isn't it? Uh, you want to change the oil in your car? Well, that's simple. Did you uh, shoot a perfect 300 bowling or an archery last week? That's pretty simple. You know, people use the word simple to refer to things that are clearly, clearly not simple. So I got to be careful how I use this word. But when I use the word in a mathematical sense, a simple curve, one that doesn't cross itself, then it's very clear what I mean by simple. So I think I'd better cross out this word simple. Simple in the English sense is in the eye of the beholder. But can I give you a procedure? Yes, I can give you a procedure. And... Will you consider it simple after I demonstrate it? Ah, uh, that's up to you. That's up to you. But I think after you practice it, it won't be so bad. So let's think about this. If I have a field that was created by a gradient, created by a potential function, and let's just look at the two-dimensional case to make a simple diagram. right, then what I'm saying is that field is a partial F partial X comma partial F partial Y. So if I give you the little F, the potential function, you can clearly create these. You can easily go this direction. But what happens if I give you the partial F partial X and partial F partial Y and ask you to go backwards, can you intuit, can you derive or deduce the little F from this snapshot? Now, I got to put a caveat on this. If the field is not conservative and there is no such potential function that I don't care what magic you use, you'll never be able to take the P and Q and work backwards and create a function. You can't create something that doesn't exist. But right now I said, if F is conservative. So if you know ahead of time that you have a conservative field, can you work backwards and create this? And the answer is, yes, you can. I'll demonstrate the procedure for you right now. So let's say I'm given this field, F of X and Y. And again, I'm only gonna demonstrate this first on two dimensional, just to do the demo. The procedure that I'm about to do also works in three dimensions, but I just wanna pick out something i'm going to pick out something in the book right here yeah just to make sure that i got this working so i'm going to make sure that i have a conservative field i'm going to take a particular example out of the book and let's say F is conservative. This example that I'm taking out of the book is section 6.3, number 116. And I will tell you the components. I'll take a very simple example to start with. 12XY and 6X squared plus six y squared. Let's see how this works. Maybe it doesn't turn out to be conservative. Can you find the potential function that gave birth 
to this field. Uh, there's a little bit of problem with my words here, right? Can you find the potential function? Can you find a potential function? That's two different things. You might be asking yourself, maybe there's other potential functions. Well, technically there are a multitude of potential functions for any one field, but they are related in a special way, but we'll do that in a second. So right here, I have partial F, partial X, and partial F, partial Y. I know that partial F, partial X is 12XY. I know that partial F partial Y is 6X squared plus 6Y squared. What I want to do is see if I can work backwards to discover F. Well, how can I work backwards to discover F? I could integrate with respect to x. For example, I got this 12xy by differential with respect to x. Maybe if I went backwards, I would learn what f is. Well, to a degree. So let's integrate 12xy with respect to x. Where did it come from? If you're just focusing on the x, you say, well, that came from 6x squared y. And that's true because if I differentiate the respect to x, I do get 12xy. Let's look at the partial f partial y, which is 6x squared plus 6y squared. Now, maybe I could work backwards and find out what f is from here. Let's integrate this with respect to y. Now, what I get is 6x squared y here. That's kind of a bad six. But if I integrate this with respect to y, I get what? 2y cubed? So what do I have right here? Clearly, if I differentiate this with respect to y, I get 6x squared plus 6y squared. So both of these statements are true to a point. Because I need one F that gives birth to this field, and I have two competing Fs. Can I deduce what F is from these two competing Fs? And I want to do this in a particular analogy, in a kind of an odd analogy. So you have to have a patience with me because. This comes from my previous experience. This happened to a friend of mine. So I say that f of x and y is clearly 6x squared y plus 2y cubed. I say that because it's very clear when I differentiate with respect to x, I get 6 x squared, bring down the 2. And the y is a constant that comes along, 12xy. And when I differentiate with respect to y, I get 6x squared plus 6y squared. This is what the field is. So this F gave birth to that field. This F is a potential function. For the field capital F. That is the gradient of F equals the field F capital F. You say, but that's not fair. How did you know F was the second one and not the first one? And I say, I didn't pick the second one or the first one. What I picked was a composite of the two. I saw that my F had to contain a piece called 6X squared Y or else this wouldn't be true. I saw that my F had to contain that piece again right here, but I also saw that my F had to contain a 2Y cubed 
or this wouldn't be true. How did I get both truths? I had to make a composite sketch of my F, so to speak. And here's the analogy. Let me number my papers. I had a friend when I was in high school and this was in another state. He was in the state of California. It's a beautiful state. And my friend's father owned a 7-Eleven. You see 7-Elevens in this area too. And one night, my friend got a phone call. His father was working at the 7-Eleven. It was a very unfortunate incident. The 7-Eleven was robbed. So friend got a phone call. Father said, come over. Uh, you know, we, we were just robbed. I need your help. You know, apparently the person had left, but the father needed some assistance. There's no physical injury or threat, but it's just a little bit shaken up. My friend rushed over to the 7-Eleven and everything was okay. But the police arrived a couple of minutes later and my friend walked out the front door. Where my friend was in high school, teenage person, a relatively large person, you know, could be a young adult or a teenager. And the police immediately drew their weapons and said, freeze. Uh, this is being at the wrong place in the wrong time, right? Of course, my friend complied, nothing negative happened, but my friend got a little bit of a scare there. I, want, I don't wanna talk about my friend, but I wanna talk about this idea of a composite sketch because after a robbery or any time multiple people observe the same incident. Now I'm gonna use a robbery because it's most vivid, but it could be anything that you and your friends observe. And then you ask them to describe what happened. Oh, did you just see that person that walked by? And one of your friends says, yeah, that bull shirt, that Chicago bull shirt, very cool. Chicago Bulls are a basketball team. Your other friend says, I noticed those sneakers. Your other friend says, gosh, that person was tall. And yet another friend says, uh, you're right, he was very tall. Did you see the scar on his left arm? Now, none of you saw exactly the same thing. But in the, let's say in the case of a robbery, well, what does a police sketch artist do? Interviews the people, one of them saw that the person was pretty tall. One of them saw a scar on their face or their arm. One of them saw the blue eyes. What does the police sketch artist do? It brings all these things together and says, okay, this is the person that we're looking for. Of course, this person is going to be pretty hard to find because I'm not a very good sketch artist. But do you see that that's what you're doing with this potential function? Partial F, partial X, partial F, partial Y you see one snapshot of the person from this angle and you see another snapshot of the person from this angle. And what you're doing is bringing these snapshots together to try to identify the person, to try to identify this potential function. Now, what I just demonstrated for you works in two dimensions or three dimensions. If I had a third observation, I would have to reconcile all three observations, yes? Okay, so this works in two dimensions or three dimensions, so long as the field is conservative, so long as an actual potential function exists. 
the procedure that I just demonstrated will not work if the field is not conservative. You'll just be spinning your wheels. If there's no potential function to be found, you won't be able to reconcile this information. Now that's a kind of a quick and direct way to identify a conservative field. Can you reconcile this information? Can you create the potential function reverse? So let's summarize what we have because we're coming to the end of our course right now, end of our morning hour. So we identified two very cool properties of conservative. Conservative field has this mixed partials relationship. Conservative field has this very cool line integral shortcut. It almost reminds us of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Or what was the fundamental theorem of calculus? If you have a function whose derivative is known and you can evaluate the integral of that derivative, you can, you can evaluate the sum of the change just by looking at the initial result subtracted from the final result. That's the sum of the change. Here, I'm writing this as a field whose potential function I know, a conservative field, dotted with TDS or dot with DR, either way you want to express it, is the value of that function at the endpoint minus the value of that function at the beginning point. I'm sorry, I squeezed that in a little too small, but it's also printed in your book. So here's another curious thing. Conservative fields have this very nice line integral calculation. I'll call it a simplified line integral calculation. Now, one more time, what happens if you start and stop at the same place along a path? What happens if the point at t equals a is the same as the point at t equals b? Well, then when you do the simplified line integral calculation, r of b and r of a are the same, then you'll just be taking the function at the same point and subtracting it from itself. So in this case, if you evaluate a line integral over a simple closed curve, you automatically get zero. And if you don't have a simple closed curve, what happens if you have a starting place? I'm sorry, now I'm writing too small. Let me try to improve that. A starting place and a stopping place that's different. Let's say you take this path to get to B. And you take this path, no crossing. I'm going to use a simple curve. No crossing. You take this crazy path to get to B right here. Well, if you think of these two crazy paths, the red and the green, if I reversed either one, they would form what? A simple closed curve where the T of A and the T of B are the same. What happens if I went along the red curve and then came backwards along the green curve? I'd get back to where I started. What happens if I went along the green curve and came back along the red curve or started at the other endpoint and did the same? Anytime I finish and start at the same point in a conservative field, I have a zero 
contribution for the field to the curve. Well, that means if going backwards along this path gets me back to where I started, that means following the red curve, following the green curve, it doesn't matter which curve I follow. That's the property we presented, and I'll give it a name called path independence. It doesn't matter how I get from here to there, the work done, the circulation, the contribution to the field will be the same. Now, you know this as a physics problem. If you lift the eraser from this level to that level directly, or if you swing the eraser around the room and over your head and up and down and then come back to that place, Since the eraser began and ended at the same position, you know that the work done is equal. And you know that the work done is equal because if you happen to drop the eraser from where you stopped, it will release the same amount of energy returning to the floor. It's called storing potential energy in the eraser. That's an example of path independence. You say, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I just lift the eraser three feet off the floor, straight up, or if I take the eraser and sail around the room, wiggle my arms for 30 seconds, and then end three feet above where I began, there's no way I did the same amount of work. I say, you gotta be careful when you talk about a problem like this as to who is doing the work. What we're saying is in the presence of the gravity field, that the net work done by gravity in moving the eraser from here to here is zero. Now that would be negative work done by gravity because you're storing energy in the eraser, which you demonstrate when you release it and it strikes the floor, it releases energy again. Maybe slightly heats up the floor that erasers aren't very massive. Or I could say that you did truly do the same work in both paths, even though you're much more tired after waving your arms around in the second path. But I have to qualify that by saying, you did the same amount of work on both paths against gravity. What was the field? You were in the presence of the gravitational field. That's why we call that a conservative field. That moving the eraser from here to here doesn't depend on the path. It just literally depends on the heights that you raise that eraser. That's the potential energy that you stored in the eraser. So we know that conservative fields exhibit these three cool properties. The question is, can we go backwards? What if conservative fields, what if a field, excuse me, has one of these three cool properties can I just automatically assume it's conservative? And the answer is no, unless we make a certain qualification. So this will be the last thing I wrote, which is uh, a little bit rushed. And so I apologize for that, but I point your attention to Theorem 610 in the book. When can I go backwards? And it says, if you have a field, this could be two or three dimensions. I'll write it as he writes it here in two and three dimensions. You could cut it down to two dimensions if you like.
So if you have a field in an open, simply connected region, you can define simply connected, makes sense in two or three dimensions, you define it the same way. And you satisfy the mixed partial property, partial P, partial Y, it's partial Q, partial X, partial P, partial Z, equals partial R, partial X, and partial Q, partial Z, sorry, partial Q, partial Z, equals partial R, partial Y, if all of these mixed partials are the same, in other words, if the curl is zero, then you may conclude that F is conservative. And that you will succeed if you construct, well, I should say, you will succeed in finding a potential function. Now that that's, that's not stated that way in the book. And so I gotta be, I mean, you will succeed if you do it properly. A potential function is there to be found. Okay, I'm gonna have to cut it off here, but let me summarize this one more time. Conservative fields have these three very cool properties. And they all turn out to be connected in a way. But just because you see these cool properties, does it mean the function is conservative? And the answer is, if you're talking about a simply connected region, then you can go backwards. If you're talking about a simply connected region, then these properties characterize, that's how we began the day, characterize conservative. And you can search for the potential function and you can use the beautiful line integral theorem that allows you to simply compute flow or as it'll happen later, flex. Okay, but you have to be very careful. It has to be a simply connected region that you observe these properties over. Okay, in your homework, you're gonna be constructing a potential function from a conservative field. So make sure you verify the field's conservative by doing these properties over a simply connected region before you look for the potential function or you won't have any success whatsoever. But I'm going to cut it off here. I'm going to go to an office hour. I'm going to get this video uploaded. So I don't mean to cut off any persons or questions, but I'm going to go out to my office hours. If I don't have an online office hour right now, but you can send me an email if you want to ask a further question before you do this homework. Other than that, you guys have a nice weekend and I'll get this stuff uploaded as soon as possible. Thank you.